You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Frank Markowitz and Lenny Schwendinger to talk about the new book, Outdoor Lighting for Pedestrians. We chat about creating legible nighttime spaces and the future of lighting and transportation. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for supporting the show each month. We really appreciate it. To join this merry band of infrastructure nerds and zoning wizards, go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. $2 a month gets you stickers and a headwritten note with a cool stamp. $10 a month gets you one of our bus only scarves. Still working on some new designs for scarves and some other cool merch and looking forward to sharing with those with y'all soon when they're finished. Also, because we do a lot of episodes covering a lot of books, we've partnered with bookshop.org as an affiliate. This means that if you buy a book through the Overhead Wire shop on Bookshop, a small amount of that purchase goes to us. Now, we love when you order from your local bookstores, but if you want to support the authors we have on the show and help keep us interviewing them, that would be tremendous. All the books we've ever discussed on the show with the authors are now in the shop. That's bookshop.org slash shop slash the Overhead Wire. That's bookshop.org slash shop slash the Overhead Wire. And finally, check out the Overhead Wire daily newsletter established in 2006. We were doing it way before anyone else thought it was cool. Join thousands of readers and sign up for a two-week trial at theoverheadwire.com to check it out. That's a two-week free trial at theoverheadwire.com. Frank Markowitz and Lenny Schwendiger, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thanks. Good to be here. Thanks a lot. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I am a retired urban transportation planner. Um, I worked both for public agencies and consulting firms, mostly as a generalist transportation planner and most recently in San Francisco for the uh, Municipal Transportation Agency. And during my career and especially at the MTA where I specialize in pedestrian safety for a time, I saw how important outdoor lighting B for pedestrian safety and and walkability, but that the lighting expertise was often siloed. And in San Francisco, especially the lighting, street lighting design and operation done by other agencies. And I really wanted to get smarter about the topic. And I didn't see much material that was good for a transportation planner or urban planner. And so when I retired, I thought this would be a hole in the knowledge base of the fields that I could fill and also find a really fascinating topic. Hi, I'm Lenny Schwendinger, and I'm an urban lighting designer which means that the lighting design that I do is focused on all the spaces in between buildings, public space, roads, riverfronts, bridges, parks, and streets. And I've been doing this for quite a long time and I'm thrilled to have contributed to Frank's book, The Outdoor Planning for Pedestrians. And Lenny, how did you get into the world of lights and lighting? Like, what was your introduction? What was the impetus for starting to go this route? I started as a filmmaker, and I have always been an activist. So I've always been involved in community engagement at the same time. So it's kind of one side is a designer artist. The other side is the technical or the engagement, or all the things that have to go alongside, in my mind, with being a designer. So I moved from filmmaking to lighting in fashion, and then artists, big projections on buildings, to the point where I felt like anything I do, I want it to be available. I want to bring attention to public space at night. And now, actually, I call myself a nighttime designer. So that's an added new discipline. And Frank, what was your introduction to lighting and transportation? You mentioned it briefly, but what set you off on the path? Yeah, the main catalyst for coming interested in the topic and eventually writing the book 
was when I was dealing with pedestrian safety problems in San Francisco. And I, I came in at a time I was the first pedestrian program manager for the city of San Francisco at a time when pedestrian safety was often front page news. And sometimes the trouble spots you'd see clearly that most of the fatalities and the injuries were at night and lighting would be an obvious factor that, sh- that you'd want to look at. And so working with the lighting specialists really got me fascinated by the topic and interested in how transportation planners, urban planners, or others could work with lighting specialists, could work on improving the nighttime environment. So I want to set the scene a little bit. What is it about nighttime that's so magical, but also a bit dangerous? Well, of course, there's reduced visibility generally, but also you really are able to focus on different sites and you don't have quite the same amount of of visual information. So you're more aware of lighting or how a building looks illuminated and the artistic effects or the interesting qualities of artificial light. Lenny specializes in that area. Sure. I like to start out talking about night as a place, a darkened place. It's different than the day. So if we're going to design for the night from street design that incorporates lighting to lighting of streets on its own, because it's an afterthought. I mean, those are two different things. Okay. Whatever we're going to do for light, we should keep in mind, is it poetry or fear? that we're lighting for. And kind of that's a provocative statement that allows designers and engineers to think about, well, there is the poetry side and the magical side, the sort of walking into the wild lights of the city together or the quiet moments in a park, let's say the anonymity and yet feeling safe and feeling the poetry of the city, as well as the issues that Frank raises, which are absolutely the you know, the threshold of the bottom line really is about safety in terms of traffic, but there's also safety in terms of welcome that we like to talk about. There's also a nighttime economy that kind of thrives on this, the availability of, of light. We even have nightmares in multiple cities now. Is the night environment just bars and parties or is it something else completely that is available to people? Well, I think I'll take that one. I just came back from a conference which is called Sociable Cities and it's the Responsible Hospitality Institute. And this is all the night mayors and city council members who are concentrating on night. In London, they have nighttime advocates as well as the night mayor, which is a night czar, who I had breakfast with the other day. And so the nighttime economy, there's a history here. A little bit of a history. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed, actually, Jeff, that you're bringing these things up. But the history is that the first nighttime mayor that was that we know of publicly, who's really championed the cause, is Merrick Milan from Amsterdam. And since then, and this has been, I'm going to say five years, just off the cuff, there's been a whole movement about nighttime economy or NTE. And it started more about bars and behavior and, you know, liquor licensing and that sort of thing. And what's happened, which is tremendous, is we've broadened the scope to mean all night, everywhere, everybody. So, for example, myself, I'm I'm focusing on night shift workers and there are many other people who are. There's night studies. What's interesting here is that it's not lighting designers who are involved in this movement. And Frank and I have had some good conversations about, you know, legibility in the cities and how, to me, legibility leads planning for the night. 
Well, let's chat about the book, Outdoor Lighting for Pedestrians. I know the book started out as a series of PowerPoints, but what was missing from the discussion that made you want to write a guidebook on lighting and and keeping in mind that legibility portion of thinking about, you know, nighttime environments and pedestrianism and transportation overall? Well, Jeff, you're you're right that the book started out with a couple of webinars that I helped organize and present at that were mainly for transportation planners and engineers on the topic generally, but focused especially on the traffic safety part of the topic. And there was a lot of interest in these webinars were well received by the transportation planners and and engineers. But I felt that there was really a need to go beyond, to go a little bit more deeply into the topic, not just, of course, on the safety effects, but the other potential benefits, the other costs or potential adverse impacts of lighting, and to broaden it, certainly beyond just traffic safety, safety for pedestrians crossing the street, when I was working for San Francisco MTA, and we would look at pedestrian safety, we focus almost entirely on pedestrian involved collisions with motor vehicles. But it realized later that really falls and tripping is a very big concern. Concern about personal security or crime is also a important even to the transportation system, of course, if people are discouraged about using public transit because they're concerned about crime, that has a big impact. And then there are the other aspects that we talk about that are very important, the sense of place, attractiveness of the nighttime environment, the contribution of lighting to the local economy. And those were all topics that in a one hour webinar, we weren't able to really deal with that I thought needed more discussion. How many hours of webinar would they have taken? <laughs> Probably a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, what was available in terms of resources for transportation and urban planning on lighting? I know that at the end of chapter two, you list a lot of lighting guides. We know that in our sphere, there's the, in Ashto and other guides are very auto-centric as opposed to say the Necto guide. Do you find that that's a a drawback in the lighting discussion as well? The lack of materials, but also a focus on specifically like an Ashto guide versus maybe a more urban focused guidebook? Yeah. So first off, the main resources on lighting were really written for roadway lighting engineers. And they were pretty intimidating, you know, the 500 page manuals, and they may be issued by organizations that I really didn't deal with as a transportation planner or an urban planner, whether it's the Illuminating Engineering Society, IES, or even a transportation group, Ashto, which yeah, is not as urban oriented. And there was also relatively limited coverage of the topic in guidebooks that I was familiar with for designing for pedestrians issued by NACTO even or other organizations. Lighting is often not given the full treatment that I felt it deserves. Part of that be that people often just don't recognize immediately that low light conditions apply, you know, not just at nighttime, you know, not just at 8 p.m. or 11 p.m., but depending on the latitude and and the season, of course, it can be pretty dark at 5 p.m. or when kids are still walking around. And that's one factor that's often overlooked. I think the importance of lighting affecting the environment, the attractiveness and the comfort of the pedestrian environment is also important. I mean, street light poles for example, are imported pieces of street furniture themselves. And and they offer opportunities to, they're going back, you know, decades to put flower baskets on them or banners, as these often do. And now there's more high-tech attachments that you can. So that is also often felt overlooked by the transportation planning street design guides that I was familiar with. I'd love to kind of piggyback on that. The street poles, first of all, are the armature. 
infrastructural armature for smart cities. So they're valuable. And then actually to jump to the beginning about what Frank was saying, that it's under-recognized. The contribution of light is under-recognized and underrated and just... It's just, you know, people, things are more important in this world, right? Material culture, point to things, sell things, you have things, you can touch things. So light itself, and I'm not talking about the lighting fixtures necessarily, but the ambiance then, the atmospheres that light provides, and then therefore the designers who create those scenographies are under-recognized. And so, you know, what I am really strong on is integrated disciplines. So street designers and architects and landscape architects working together to integrate lighting and also to posit new, more innovative types of lighting. So to tie together the armature and the smart lighting and the more innovative, creative, let's recognize lighting issue moments, the idea of creating spaces that are evocative, that are friendly, that are inspiring, as well as safe when you step off the curb, as well as safe before you trip on the pavement. All of this, in a sense, leads to the phrase walkability. So walkability is, again, such an integrated issue, right? So I love Frank's idea of like tripping over the sidewalk. I love that because that, boom, design the pavement differently, you know, employ different types of pavement, do it better. Plus, what are we doing on the sidewalks? How interesting is it? Where do we want to go? Are the shop fronts illuminated? You know, what about that street corridor at night? I think these are all issues that are so important. And yet, hopefully, with the book and lots of efforts about nighttime, we can kind of put it more front and center. I mean, that's why I'm pretty excited about being on this podcast so that, you know, planners and architects can think, you know, maybe we want to start with lighting. What about the nighttime? Let's start with lighting. Let's see what that should be and how it'll contribute to the design of the street. It's so interesting you talk about kind of the nature of light and how it's there. You see it, obviously, and it exists, but it's not a solid. It's not something you can touch necessarily, but it can create places. It can create a space. It can, you know, make it so that you feel like you're enveloped or you feel like you're able to go to a certain place or or not able to go to another place because of whether it's dark or light or other ways. And so I think that that's interesting from that perspective, thinking about it kind of in the abstract of it's not a solid object, but it does create place. And there are a lot of different aspects of the light that affect how it changes the environment. And it's not just the sheer amount of light, the illuminance or luminance levels, the amount of light, but factors like the glare or color rendition, how accurately colors show up. Those are also important factors, how the lighting is used. Lyon in France has made a major effort to add lighting to create a very attractive nighttime environment and focus lighting on points of historic interest or visual interest and to tailor the lighting to the particular characteristics of the sites that are being lit. And I mentioned in the book, Urban Park Lighting, where they'll try to vary the lighting characteristics, such as the color appearance, correlated color temperature of lighting, depending on whether it's shining on a historic feature, the park, or it's more the, the vegetation. So there's a lot to consider to determine how effective lighting is. Well, I just had no idea that there were so many ways to measure light until I read the book. There's just so many ways to measure and understanding the importance of things like contrast. I mean, you know, for folks that are listening, what is contrast and why is it so important for transportation planning and lighting generally? So that's a good point, Jeff. There are a number of different metrics and factors. Contrast is is one is 
how well the object of interest, like a pedestrian, is showing up against the background and positive contrast is when, say, the pedestrian appears brighter than the background, negative when it's the reverse of the background is brighter than, say, the pedestrian. And all those different factors or metrics can be really important. I, I mentioned how in San Francisco, I would deal with pedestrian safety issues, hotspots, there's one intersection, I remember dealing with a, a high level of nighttime pedestrian injuries and fatalities, Market and Castro Street intersection, which is you know, the Harvey Milk Plaza, and also a location where there's a lot of pedestrian activity for the gay rights center of San Francisco. But in any case, I consulted a roadway lighting engineer and expressed concern about the lighting at that location. And to my non-expert eye, it seemed like there was a problem just by picking out PEDS crossing the street. And this engineer went out and measured light levels presumably like illuminance or the amount of light falling on crosswalks and pedestrians. And anyway, he came back and said, it's fine, meets light standards. But that can be missing a lot of other factors. Contrast can be one, perhaps the pedestrians have a lot of light, but then there's also so much light in the background that they're kind of washed out. There can be glare that's the drivers are getting a lot of unwanted light in their in their eyes. Often there's a, a problem that the crosswalk is pretty brightly lit, but the street corner is so underlit that pedestrians seem to pop into view. And suddenly, you know, you don't get any real warning. You don't know at nighttime, if you're a driver, that it's a pedestrian crossing until they're actually in the crosswalk. And so there are a lot of different factors that need to be considered. I just want to put a plug in for lighting designers. <laughs> you know, I do, I do have a little anecdote where I say, you know, give two people the standards and one is a engineer and the other is a designer. And they may come up with completely two different solutions which match the standards. So competency is one thing. We better all be competent. But the psychological responses, the nuances of, as you're calling it, measurements, uniformity, lack of uniformity, you know, texture, including brightness, right? But not just brightness, all have to do with a good lighting design. And I'm, you know, I think the book is going to be super helpful so that engineers get a sense of the nuances and get a sense of the complexity so that they do begin to, you know, request a lighting designer on the job. You know, let's collaborate with a lighting designer for a basis of design for this to get those nuances on the page and into some sort of early specifications so that that is a set level, a threshold basis of design. I mean, I've worked on major, you know, engineering projects, subways and bridges and things like that. And really, honestly, a lighting engineer is going to come up generally with a different solution unless they've had design experience. Well, I think a lot of people imagine that, you know, when you're building a street and you're putting up street lights, you're done. Oh, yeah, we have to have a street light there. And then you put it up and it's finished and there's no other considerations necessarily. It seems like that might be the, the engineering way. But there are a lot of things to consider. So one of the things that I think the book does really well is it kind of delves into like, what are the questions that people should be asking themselves? when they're thinking about designing a space for cars or for people, what are the questions designers should ask themselves when thinking about, you know, transportation lighting before picking and installing a system or even before, you know, going into a design of it? I mean, what are the things that folks should be lining up on their to-do list in order to think about this more intelligently than, say, just putting in the light pole and then you're done? Good question, Jeff. The designer of new lighting needs to be considering the facility, the environment, the needs of the pedestrian, what are the land uses, the attractions in the area, what are other aspects of the street environment. There could be street trees that could affect the lighting. There could be ambient lighting, a high level of private lighting right next to the street lights or the pedestrian scale lights that may affect their effectiveness. 
there can be particular adverse impacts that need to be careful for. And the book goes into the effects on flora and fauna of light. And sometimes there are sensitive species that could be affected by lighting. The designer also considers the equipment itself, like uh, light poles and are they possible obstruction and especially for people with mobility or visual impairments. Recently heard a, a complaint from a uh, transportation engineer who was talking about ornamental lighting installed recently in his hometown on a arterial street where the light poles were not put in the curb zone, the street furniture zone, but were offset quite a bit. So it's creating kind of a zigzag pattern or almost feeling like an obstacle course if you're if you're going down kind of the street. So there's a lot to consider beyond just the light levels and of course to consider how things may change. Vegetation may grow, land uses or that ambient lighting may change over time. I always like to say that lighting is like a plant. You have to take care of it. I mean, beyond the normal, you know, let's change out the light bulb. We don't even have light bulbs anymore. We have diodes. But aside from changing the light source and, you know, if a car hits a light pole and you have to replace the pole, aside from that, there is concerns to measure the output because it does change over the years. There's concerns to relamp and there are, you know, electrical issues that could change. So I think you're right though, Jeff, people do sort of think of just, just plonk it down and it's a light pole with a light, a luminaire at the end, by the way. (laughs) So it's a street light pole. There's a luminaire and there is the pole. The pole is always the armature and it's definitely underrated what you kind of wiring. And now, you know, the potential for devices to measure, you know, pollution and parking and all that stuff. I did work on on a smart lighting report for a manufacturer that, you know, I was just shocked. <laughs> they didn't really care about the lighting. They only <laughs> cared about the armature. I mean, honestly, when we did did the work together, it was kind of like, what can it hold? What should shape be for the pole and how the wiring should work? And, you know, how many devices can we put on and this and that? And it was like, well, by the way, what's the quality of light being emitted? So it's a funny kind of blind spot. <laughs> There's a great diagram in the book about that. I was like, I didn't thought about this before, but the light source at the top in the luminaire, it comes out and there's an angle at which it goes down to the ground. And then if the tree's in the way, there's needs for tree trimming. Even if the tree is on the sidewalk on the other side of the street, there's a necessity to, if you want to keep the area illuminated, to make sure that the trees are trimmed and those types of things. So it's the area around, it's like you were mentioning, it's not just that. I want to go back to another thing that you talked about, Frank, and I think it's a really important point, especially for transportation folks, is this idea that pedestrians come out of nowhere. You hear this all the time, you know, from folks who ended up hitting a deer or hitting a person. I think this was actually the experience that the Uber driver had when they killed Elaine Herzberg in Phoenix, Arizona from the autonomous vehicle testing that was going on, she came out of nowhere. So even, you know, coming out of nowhere happens to autonomous vehicles as well. But this is an issue of they're not coming out of nowhere. They're obviously there. It's an issue of light. It's an issue of contrast. It's an issue of whether you can see them or not and the design of the systems that allow us to operate at night without danger. And I thought that that's kind of an interesting and important point to share because it's something that when I was reading the book, I was like, oh, This is something that's important because I hear this all the time. (laughs) They came out of nowhere. No, they didn't. It's how things are designed. Right. I think there's more sensitivity to that among the lighting specialists and the people who are doing the research and, and manuals. For example, there's a metric surround ratio that is increasingly being used, which is to look at the illumination levels on the shoulder, on the sidewalk, and how they relate to the roadway lighting. And that's in a solid state roadway lighting guide that is produced mainly by uh, Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. And that guide also talks about LEDs, light emitting diodes that are the solid state 
lighting that is completely taking over for the older style, like high pressure sodium, but the, the LED lighting, while it, there are a lot of advantages, if you use them in the old fashioned way, you just replace one for one, the LEDs can have a very focused beam. And if it's focused just on the roadway, then the sidewalks are not getting lit even to the level that they were with the older say high pressure sodium lighting. So you'd have more of a problem with heads not being visible until they're actually in the roadway. Um, so this guide really points to the, the need to pay attention to that issue. Let's talk about light pollution. I'm putting quotes around it because <laughs> you all say obtrusion, and I think that's a, a good distinction. One of my favorite experiences was a summer camp in West Texas, basically outside of of Fort Davis and the McDonald Observatory in far West Texas. And you can see the stars and all the beautiful clouds of the universe. But should cities really worry about light obtrusion? And and what's important to consider when you're thinking about lighting in a city versus maybe lighting in in the countryside, especially when it comes to road lights, street lights, all everything that we're talking about today? You know, my humble opinion is that both obtruding light anywhere, whether it's like trespass into somebody's apartment window or a garage light going on at, you know, the dead of night, but, you know, you're still awake, but like trespass or whether it's glare, as you mentioned, which hurts the eyes, that's basically the definition, light that hurts your eyes or sky glow, which is the thing that we're talking about with the observatory and the sky. I think, you know, personally, and I, I take the stand now, you know, there's some of us who are very metropolitan city focused that, you know, it's important for us to help people get out of their places in the evening. It's important to have activities in public space and the evening can be another a third place, a place that people can go. So for me, the question of sky glow is second to lighting that is safe and inspired for human beings. There are, you know, with the model lighting ordinances that we have, you know, conservation areas for wildlife. I've designed in Shanghai a long, long park where part of it was a conservation space for nocturnal animals. Then it was a discussion of, you know, should we have some light in case if we have no light, which would be perfect, then the park goers may fall into that stream, you know, or might hurt themselves. But if we have a little bit of light, but, oh, on the other hand, they might not go there at all, which is what we want. And then if we have some light, is that safer? So there's always that kind of conflict anyway. And personally, the, the end of my statement here is really that it's site-specific. Everything's local. You know, you just really have to look into the highest need, how lighting can help. Well, those good points, Lenny. There are a lot of tools, I mean, that you touched on and physical means to try and reduce light pollution or unnecessary and harmful light. I mean, there can be lighting ordinances that you refer to regulating the amount of light. There can be physical shielding, how LEDs are used, which I mentioned the more focused beam can be also can be helpful. Well, it can be helpful in terms of reducing, say, light trespass on an adjacent residence, but can also be a problem that there's more subject to glare if not properly designed. And pedestrians often complain a lot about glare. So luckily, there are a lot of measures and tools that can be used to try and reduce these harmful side effects of lighting. You know, to get into the technical stuff, which I'm, I'm glad you just did, it's basically comes down to optical and mechanical. So the shields or the optics, but I'm, you know, I'm standing on the ground for people who should be using the night in a public way. That's interesting, uh, you know, especially about trespass, because there was an article yesterday in Route 50, where they're talking about the kind of the public health of the pandemic and whether you're a night owl or an early bird. And there was a, a piece talking about how during the pandemic, night owls have gotten a bit of break from the early bird world. 
And a lot of this, I feel like, has to do with how light impacts, whether you're a night owl or an early bird, whether light comes in and wakes you up or whether it's this annoying thing that happens to you in the morning because you stayed up because your body is more used to the nighttime. And so that's interesting part about, you know, the transfer from the high pressure sodium to LEDs. That's the interesting discussion about how the light, you know, trespass impacts people who might be sleeping in bedrooms that get this kind of light that comes in that they didn't ask for, they didn't want. Behind my house, there's an apartment complex that has this really bright light on and you could see it basically throughout the night. And luckily I'm I'm kind of a night owl and I can fall asleep, but I can imagine where somebody would get that through their back window and they just have to, you know, basically put a tinfoil over the or their window or something that just could, you know, black it out because it was really frustrating. But the public health aspect is really an interesting part of this discussion as well, I imagine. Yeah. And it's a great controversy or what we call a conflict. You're talking about chronotypes, which is the night yeah. owl versus the morning lark. I'm a night owl myself. You know, I'd be happy to start all my days at three o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon, but I basically I compromise and say eleven or twelve. It's and you know there isn't well there isn't one rule. There really isn't, and there are many many books. It's a lot of literature on nighttime and sleep. And ancient, not ancient, but historic habits. I mentioned the second sleep earlier. It's just, you know what? It's so damn interesting. (laughs) And the point is that lighting leads the way. You know, we're, we're making it possible to enjoy the night, to experience. I mean, okay, I hear people out there arguing that, you know, put your flashlight down, just enjoy the moon, the full moon is a half foot candle. You know, that's fantastic. I've been in the country as well. But I think we're, pedestrian lighting occurs in places that have pedestrians, not hikers. I'd, I'd like to hear Frank mention something about, you know, what we haven't covered in a way is, you know, what we didn't, we just glossed over is like, is there enough? pedestrian lighting. I mean, in New York, the light, as as Frank was saying, you know, it was either backspill from a street light, like errant light onto the sidewalk or front spill all the way to that sidewalk from the light across the street. But I don't know of a whole lot of specifications or guidelines that even talk about pedestrian light. It's almost always automobile light. What do you think, Frank? So agree, Lenny, that that often pedestrian scale lighting is overlooked. And those are the shorter poles, maybe 10 to 18 foot high that are spaced more frequently, say every 50 feet or or so. And pedestrian scale lighting, which primarily for the, the sidewalk, that is often really appreciated by pedestrians and an important part of complete street redesign. And that is really an area that I think needs more attention and research. Like there's not a lot out there on really on guidance on when is pedestrian scale lighting especially needed and helpful and how much of an impact does it have on falls on traffic related injuries? Well, what you mentioned in the book is reassurance. That comes up a number of times. Can you explain reassurance to folks? It's an interesting concept. So reassurance is the pedestrian's feeling of confidence when walking alone at night. That's how the primary coiner user of the the term defines it. There are a lot of similar terms, but it can refer to the pedestrian's comfort level related to a tripping hazards, to crime, a really basic level to being able to see and know where they are and feel confident that they're going the right path. I'm curious what you think the future of lighting design is and, and the future of lights. There's so many discussions that are a little bit futuristic. I mean, there's there's these ideas of bioluminescent sidewalks and stuff like that. But what is the real future of lighting in cities? I think that lighting will be more tailored to the environment, potentially with automated vehicles, who who knows whether they're going to take over, but the need for, for lighting to avoid motor vehicles crashing into crossing pads, that may be re- reduced, but there will 
will still be the need for lighting so pedestrians can find their way and avoid tripping and falling. And then with electric scooters, example, increasing in popularity, there's even more need for that aspect of safety for lighting. And I think we, we've discussed some of the other aspects um, and values of, of lighting. And I think there'll be more attention to that, to using lighting in a more subtle and varied way, both for the illumination effects and the type of equipment, whether it's uh, historic or futuristic or artistic. So I, I think there's a lot of potential for improvement and customizing lighting to really in increase the benefits and, and minimize any adverse impacts and tailor it to the particular environment. Lenny has worked on a guidebook specifically for smart lighting projects, and the book does get into smart lighting a good bit. And there are three aspects of smart lighting that I see, and this is, this is really in increasing. So there's adaptive lighting where the illumination levels or characteristics of the light can be varied according to the environment. Like as there are more pedestrians, then the light levels can, can go up. There's connected or network lighting, which is connecting the street lights to a central location or computer so you can have an improved control and for maintenance that so you could quickly find out, for example, if there is an outage. And then the third category is smart poles, smart city applications, where it's not really about the illumination itself, but it's about the value of Poles being used to house sensors or video or even e EV chargers or uh, electronic information, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of potential there. And if you're, if you're a city doing citywide or district lighting, for example, you really need to think, what are we going to do, if anything, for um, smart lighting? Yeah, Lenny brought that up a little bit. I thought that was really interesting where you said basically that, you know, cities don't really care about the lights. They, they want the pole. Right. They want the access that, to the space. The armature, the structure to be able to put right. sensors. The one thing I would, I would add on top of that, because I thought that was a great summary, is that what we've seen in, in research we've done is as cities convert to LED, which is happening, and a lot of cities are buying back their light poles from utilities. So, you know, this whole ownership question as well. It is recommended that they look into the possibilities of smart lighting because they can at least add the provision of the wiring for future smart lighting and smart city devices, even if they don't want or cannot be budget reasons do it now. But we do find that that's a turning point. And so the other part to that is, as Frank just said, is to create a lighting plan, a strategy, a light strategy for their cities. And that's not something we really talked about in the book, but you know, and it's not done that much in the US, an overall master plan with light is a thing. And if you are converting to LED, why not focus on the needs of the entire city and the district and the future lighting as well as smart lighting, which is bound to come around? Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, we just talked to Dr. Asal Biamargs from the University of New South Wales, and, and what she said was talking about underground cities and having underground city plans. And so I think this is something that you know, the, the overall plan for, a you know, a certain implementation strategy is really important, whether it's underground cities, whether it's lighting, whether it's transportation plans, et cetera, having a plan that, that brings everything together instead of piece by piece or piecemeal or in silos, I think is really going to be really important. A couple of numbers that I think were really important that you mentioned in the book, you mentioned in the book that LA spends about $188 per year on each street light, and then LED saves money. You also mentioned that by 2035, we will be able to, by, if LEDs are implemented throughout the country, we'll be able to save around a trillion dollars. I think it was like 900 and something billion, but I'm thinking a trillion is pretty close. I'm also curious, though, that's an interesting number. I'm also curious, will we run the risk of if, we, if all these lights are more efficient, will we try to have more lights? 
Well, we try to, because we're saving money, you just build more of them. And so you have the same amount of energy consumed. You have the same amount of even more light produced. You might end up saving money in the start, but then you spend that money on something else. Well, hopefully there'd be a lot of thought to where you would add lighting and it would be at the only the most effective needed locations besides the change to leds but related to that is that this smart lighting and control can increase the savings as well and the federal department of energy has been pushing for um, greater use of, of that where you know you could for example reduce lighting levels based on less need that's detected, for example, more efficient lighting patterns. So smart lighting can really increase the savings that LEDs themselves will bring. So it's a funny thing. What Jeff said about, is there the potential of more lighting since we've saved both in energy and in uh, maintenance, basically? That's a big conversation, by the way. There are some people, you know, on in my sort of communication lines that are saying that that is happening in Europe. Or so again, the education about lighting, which we're doing right now, is super important to take to heart in terms of energy saving. I can see a lot in the future, and one is that more creative lighting will be incorporated in the future. I have a pilot that I worked on with Numo. We've got concepts for light and transportation or mobility rather that have to do with intersections and building corners. And it's really about, again, legibility and also signaling pedestrians and cars and more creative and mixed in with, you know, standard pedestrian lighting, for example. I have a dream that one day private lighting that is light that is on the side of a building or from shop fronts that becomes more ascendant as we understand lighting better will supersede light pole lighting by sensors. So in other words, light pole lighting would go down when private lighting comes up because it's just, it's just so much better for travelers and pedestrians at night. And then I also think that it process wise, as we build these creative possibilities and prove that they're safe and prove that they're inspiring, get people out at night, that more pilots will be incorporated with more community engagement. So for me, a pilot isn't just, you know, put up a street pole and get people to send in the survey and say, well, no, that was that lighting was too cool or that lighting was too warm or that was too glary. No, you work with people before the pilot, you, you try some stuff out, obviously not just a light pole, but, and you, and you develop it with a community group that is committed that you've been able to commit. And that way we can try new things. And then finally, I am seeing a lot of public art with light in a more high quality where municipals are willing to conserve and maintain light projects from artists, you, you just can't imagine how there just wasn't anything like that when I started. I mean, really, it's amazing how that's grown. So those are my ideas about the future. Nice. Well, hopefully in the future, folks will get the book as well. And so that they can plan all these things and hire nighttime designers. That would be helpful too, right? Um, the book is Outdoor Lighting for Pedestrians. Um, where can folks find it if they want to get a copy? It's uh, available on Amazon and all the major online booksellers and published by Routledge. And you can find it if you Googled Markowitz Lighting. Yeah, well, we tell folks to go to their local bookstore and ask for it. Also, you can go to IndieBound or Bookshop.org and you can connect to your local bookstore as well if you're not a big fan of the Forest Company. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so folks can get the book and... It's really great. I hope folks will get a chance to check it out, especially if they're thinking about doing any outdoor lighting design, especially from an urban transportation perspective. I mean, this is a subject that I felt like I didn't know too much about. Hopefully the questions we asked were, were good ones because it's not something that I focused on a lot, but I think that I will in the future and I hope that others will as well. Well, Frank and Lenny, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Jeff.
And thanks for joining us. The Talking Kidways podcast is a project of the Overhead Wire and posted first at Streets Blog USA. Thanks to our wonderful Patreon supporters for sponsoring this show and Mondays at the Overhead Wire. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. You can sign up for our 15-year-old newsletter at theoverheadwire.com. And you can listen to the show on your podcatcher of choice, including Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, and Apple Podcasts. And if you can't find it there, you can always find it at its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways.